<laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. This is Sam. I'm here with Luke. One of us is slightly more active than the other at the moment. Um, who knows? Maybe some other people will uh, um, drop in. But right. we we just had we we've been talking and thinking about nonviolence, violence, Christian history, and all of those sorts of things recently. And so we just wanted to talk, I guess, about that. Luke and I have talked a bunch, but it's been a long time since we recorded anything. That's right. I've been wanting to for for quite a while. I've I mean, in something that's maybe not Trinitarian. If anybody, <laughs> you can probably see me, but I'm multitasking. This is a, probably a first time if this is going to end up on randos. This is called <laughs> this is called working out and also talking to your internet friends. Yeah, <laughs> multitasking. Um, so I, I guess sort of the background is is that um, maybe Julian and Cipher had a, a forum quality oh, yeah. yep. uh, uh, argument relating to nonviolence. I'm not sure how that subject came up, but um, I guess sort of the general idea is that in early Christianity, it seems pretty clear that it was a very important Christian distinctive to be nonviolent. And that meant not volunteering for the army. Um, that meant not going to watch gladiatorial games or participate in gladiatorial games unless they threw you in with the Lions, I guess. But and this way, does UFC count? E maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Watching UFC might not have been so kosher for the early Christians. A little bit too close to gladiatorial games. Um, and that you know. Uh, various forms of Judaism were insurrectionist or rebellion oriented, right? Because, you know, basically they thought that there should be a Jewish king over Israel and that the Romans being over them was, you know, improper. And so they, that was part, part of the role of the Messiah was to yep. be uh, a liberator uh, militarily, spiritually, and otherwise. And, you know, there was like, I don't even know how many Jewish rebellions there were in like, you know, those couple centuries. There was a lot. Not <laughs> like, enough. Am I right, Jacob? <laughs> None of them particularly successful. And in various ones of them, you know, the Romans would backlash and then either destroy the temple or eventually just kick all of the Jews out of the homeland and rename yeah. it to Palestine. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, no, one second. Uh -oh. Do you need anything for me? Okay. Real life. All right. Real life. Yeah. Real <laughs> life is a thing. So I think that, you know, there's verses in the Bible about being obedient to authority, right? That, you know, some modern day Christian politicians might take out of context. But an important part of that, I think, was the idea that Christians aren't insurrectionists, right? Mm. They're not rebelling. We're not we're not creating a Christian ethno state in contrast to the Roman Empire or something like yeah. that. In the um, world, but not of the world. In the world, not of the world. My kingdom is not of this world, right? Yep. You know, uh, and and you you get that in the crucial in the trial narratives of Jesus, right? Where they're trying to figure out: Are you an insurrectionist? Are you one of those kind of messiahs? Or are you just some sort of spiritual guy, right? That that seems to be you know part of the the the, uh, the trial narratives. And Pilate's yeah. like, this guy doesn't seem like one of the insurrectionist fellows, so yeah. I don't yeah. see the problem with him. Yeah. Um, and this guy's no threat to me, or <laughs> is he? Or is he? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so for a long time, for, for multiple centuries, that was a very strong Christian distinctive, is that they, they didn't fight, they, they didn't resist violence, and that they had this enemy love and all that sort of thing. And, yeah, and I, would add in, I would add in right here that since I've asked Preston Sprinkle, who wrote a book on this, um, to do a Randall's talk, so maybe he will eventually but um he has told me that uh the conviction and practice of christian nonviolence was the most universally accepted doctrine of the early church like even yeah. more so than the divinity of christ which baffles moderns and i don't have i i don't have any reason to doubt that right I, I, I'm, I haven't studied the topic nearly as much as Preston has, but I, I don't, nothing comes to mind that says that that isn't true. Um, and 
and so that that's a that's an important thing that you know for christians who value the early christian witness right who say right, which doesn't think, it's yeah that's not necessarily like a proof like a truth right. bomb you know proof box but it's a factor yeah yeah it's a factor especially for for people who really think that sort of the apostolic age was like getting christianity right and yes. should be yep. looked back to with um you know reverence and the desire to imitate it that's an important data point that as far as we know that was just a universal christian teaching and practice even when there was heresies and splits among lots of different other sorts of yep. things um but then you know things start to change right and so you know there was various you know stages ebbs and flows of christian persecution um and during those uh, intense periods of, of persecution, your options as a Christian were flee for the hills, right? Um, stay at home and take it, or, yep. you know, perhaps maybe give in a little bit and, and stuff like that. But as far as I know, they never fought back, right? Even the yeah. people who might have given some incense to the emperor or, you know, kind of given in under the persecution, they were, you know, they were submitting to the Roman authority, they weren't fighting back. Uh, so do you think, could someone bring up the possibility that that was just due to being a minority? Um, or do you think it was due to religious conviction? I think it was due to religious conviction. And I think that it had to do with the spiritualized understanding of the nature of the kingdom of God that Jesus had inaugurated. And, and that- well, Okay, well, what do you mean by that? Flesh that out, because that doesn't mean non-material, non-earthly. Right, it doesn't mean non-material, non-earthly, but it means that it's not a earthly polity yet, yeah. right? Um, they, they weren't trying to make their own government, essentially. Yeah. It's not of the nature of worldly authority and power. Right. I'm pretty yeah. sure all Christians, or at least most of them, you know, maybe not the Gnostics, but most Christians expected Jesus to come back and set up something that resembled, but was also even more important and powerful than like an earthly, an earthly polity. Right. right. They that actually, him. yep. That came up in my discussion this morning with uh, Roaring Monkey on the Discord, but Alex, who, uh, whatever, he's an agnostic, I think that's pretty public knowledge, or atheist, but um, he brought up that very point. Well, and Cal has been bringing this up recently of kind of the failed prophetic nature of those apocalyptic or eschatological early return, you know, statements. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he was wondering this morning that if some of this early Christian, and we talked about this a little bit with Julian, that if some of the early Christian convictions around nonviolence was somewhat pragmatic in the sense that, well, Jesus is coming back. You know, he's going to come and fix all this pretty soon. Yeah. We don't need to defend ourselves. Right. You know, I, I think there was some of that. And like the early church fathers, like Justin, Martyr and Irenaeus still clearly have the Jesus is coming back pretty soon. And yeah. the antichrist is going to be perhaps probably some Roman emperor in the near future that yeah. will initiate the eschaton. Yeah, that, that, that seems to have been a pretty uh, uh, common early teaching. And in Little fact, did they know it was Trump. Or actually, <laughs> like, it can't be Trump now. It's got to be Biden. No, it's, it's Biden. Yeah. No, right. it's Kamala Harris. That's the sneaky yes. part. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, so I think that that was a pretty common early church conviction is that the Roman powers that be were still, in some sense, they were ordained by God. This is the weird thing about, like, you can see yep. this in Paul, right? Yep. That that all rulers are put in place in some sense as part of God's providence, right? Like, there's well, that's Old verse, Testament too, isn't that in Isaiah? That's Old Testament and it's New yeah. Testament, like Paul saying, yeah. you know, God cordoned off for each people group the times and their boundaries and their yep. leaders, yep. so yep. that God, so that they might be close, so that they might be able to hear God, right? Right. Because God is not far from any of us, right? It's right in that right. same passage. Um, right. But but yet so so that's part of the argument for cooperation with authorities, and that's part of the argument against maybe Jewish insurrectionism, is mm -hmm. that that even the powers that be, even though that they're evil, because Paul certainly knew how evil the Roman Empire was, but there's something about them that's God ordained. 
but yet, even though there's got, even though the powers that be, the powers and principalities, right, and they they very much had the there's powers in heaven and there's powers on earth, and they're very intertwined, right? Like yep. there's a you know probably a spiritual demon Roman emperor that's kind of above and sort of right behind the yeah. earthly human Roman emperor, and, or yeah, oh, and or Persia a, and oh, yeah, yeah, principality that isn't Rome. Right. Or yeah. Something. There's yeah. the principality of Rome and there's the current earthly ruler who is the Roman emperor, but there's yeah. also the kind of more spiritually yep. significant power behind the throne. Yep. And, and that's true for all of the powers and that they're yep. they're demonic in a sense. Right. Like Paul calls uh, Satan the god of this age. Right. And yep. the prince of the power of the air. There's some yep. sense in which Satan is. Uh, rebelling against God's authority, but is in charge of the, the the kingdoms of the earth, right? Like when Satan tempts Jesus, says, "Hey, I could give you all of these kingdoms." It wasn't a vain boast. Yeah, right? I I, yeah. I, I think that's... Lord of Spirits, <laughs> right? Stuff. Yes. Yeah. So so there there's that sort of thing. So it's like the powers that be are evil, but they're also God ordained, right? It, yeah. I, I'm not quite always sure exactly hey, how, how it's this intent. is like, yeah, it's very book of Job though, too. Yeah. I mean it's yeah. very I think this is a I don't know, I find it to be a very common biblical motif. And I think it's only well, and that's part of uh what is I heard I first heard this term from Pete Enns, uh oh earmuffs, but um monolatry is uh -huh. he was saying that Jew, Jewish people you know Elohim and there's there were many gods Christians and Jews and I don't know I assume Muslims you know more about Islam than me believe in a multitude of gods they just believe in one god mm -hmm. yep just one god Jacob right and and in in the early Christian pagan debates the Christian supreme god Sorry. The Christians don't often say, oh, your gods don't exist. How silly of you to worship non-existent gods. They say, right. oh, no, those aren't gods. Those are demons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. You know, uh, that that's their their more common argument. Demon um, gods. OK, let's bring it back to violence. Right. So right. so somehow that fit in with this ethos of you don't fight the powers that be because in some sense they're the right yeah. thing we but, do not wage war against flesh and blood but against principalities yeah. right right and so what has happening is now that jesus has been exalted to the right hand of god jesus is um uh god is letting jesus fight the principalities and powers to bring them in submission right you know i uh, sit at my right hand until i make your enemies a footstool for your feet yeah right yeah, yeah. that that's the verse that christians understand to be sort of what's going on now right yep. jesus is at god's right hand and now all the principalities and powers are sort of there's this cosmic war going on yeah where jesus is submitting all the principalities and powers to himself well right but what if in a non-dualist frame though where where those spiritual realities are happening in the real world or in the material world sorry freudian slip um what if god is bringing those principalities into submission through my swith and what smith and wesson <laughs> you know what i mean right and 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 that, and I think that that's part of the the theological motivation for Christian nonviolence is that the way that we beat the powers, the way that we submit these powers, is that we Christianize them, right? It's how we, Christ did it. How did he do it? Right. Weird. Yeah. yeah. And you do it by being willing to die, by loving your enemies, and all of these things. And the way that you beat evil is by letting evil do its worst to you, and then it bounces back on it in some sort of a trampling, way. trampling it down from the inside. Like Paul, yeah. is, Paul mm -hmm. Vanderclay is often saying, "If someone's going to die, let it be me." Yeah, yeah, yes. And so then, so then I think what happens is Christianity gets to the weird point of Constantine, right? Yeah. And and so then the question is, is did is that the manifestation that Christianity has beaten the principality of Rome, right? Mm. And, and that that now the principality of Rome is now put under. Um, you know, that that is a sign. The fact that the emperor is now Christian, how Christian Constantine himself mm. was is an interesting question. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll just say, you know, he's Christian for now. Um is so that... do you think in the early church then, sorry to interrupt, but like they're essentially saying, do you think they would have thought that 
the, the emperor is now Christian. This is the eschaton. This is the coming. This is the, or at least the beginning of, I don't know, the return of Christ to earth in the church. And I think an interesting thing that happens, uh, so we, I, I, the, the effect on nonviolence is a, a, certainly an important question, but I think part of what happens is eschatological. Like previously, like I said, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, they sound like crazy American dispensationalists who think that the world is going to end at any time and that this political figure or maybe that political figure or whoever is the Antichrist. Right? Let me go get my placard. Repent, yeah. the end is near. Repent the end is here. You're like Timothy LaHaye left behind sort of stuff, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty similar to that, honestly. Um, oh. and, and they think that it's going to be a Roman antichrist. And so then the question is, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, the Roman empire is now Christian. We don't think the emperors are evil anymore. And, and what happens is, is that premillennialism, right? It switches into a millennialism or post millennialism. And actually, mm. I, I've heard this before. I think one of the few doctrines that the Eastern Church has outlawed or declared anathema is essentially pre millennialism. They have a different word for it, it's like chiliasm or something. I forget what the Eastern Orthodox word Ooh, for That it. sounds delicious. For, yeah, chiliasm. <laughs> you know, go, go get it at your local falafel place. Um, but but I, I think that they basically outlaw or ban pre-millennialism oh, i don't know that i wish someone who knew more about orthodoxy was here yeah. one of us is theoretically <laughs> maybe supposed to know something <laughs> and, and and it kind of makes interesting and it kind of makes sense because the the doom and gloom uh eschatology doesn't really fit the circumstance anymore yeah and i would say that's sort of when christianity switched from being you know oh hey the, the souls are just waiting for Jesus to come back, right? And yeah, then we'll yeah. have the resurrection and the millennial kingdom and the messianic age and everything will be honky-dory to I either go to heaven when I die or I go to hell when I die. And the whole point is for me to be a good person now so I go up and set it down, right? Mm. And, and and like the, the resurrection and the return to Christ is still kind of there because it doesn't get rid of, but it's like, de-emphasize and it's not as important anymore yeah yeah well and it's i don't know the whole no i think that's really interesting relating pre-millennial pre-millennialism to kind of that early church anticipation um what was the did i miss what was the connection though with violence because i mean that's the thing that's weird though right because the early church wasn't violence because yeah. they anticipated an imminent return but mm -hmm. most most premillennialist dispensationalists pretty strong adherence of violence yes yeah yeah okay that's a good point <laughs> yeah and and they're often something close to christian national christian uh, american nationalist or yeah, something for like sure that. for yeah. sure so so what i think happens is you know constantine was a pretty bloody guy right the reason why constantine became you know that he reunited east and west but you know that wasn't a peaceful process the way he did it yeah, and yeah. he he killed some of his sons he killed some of his nephews he killed his mom you know like he he killed a lot of people to make sure that he stayed in power right that very machiavellian any threat to my rule just needs to be eliminated Right. Listen, but all to the glory of Jesus. This is the key. Um, and he didn't get baptized until his deathbed, pretty much. Right. Oh. And that that's part Sorry, of it. That was a bad joke. <laughs> so I think part of the reason why he did that is like, man, I have to do some Roman emperoring first <laughs> before yeah. before I become a Christian. So we got to build the kingdom using the devil's tools before I really commit to this Christian thing. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And and there's a certain amount of that that he's respecting the Christian perhaps emphasis on nonviolence by delaying his baptism. Right. You can see that that's a, a weird way of, of respecting that ideal. Well, yeah, but in a weird way that I would call like neo-gnostic and like an abstracted yeah. spiritual way. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like let, it's like what Augustine said. Let me be Christian. Just not yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll get I'll get all that good Christianing in after I uh, sow my wild oats. 
Right, right. Or, or or like you can imagine people who party too much in college, like, oh, yeah, who grew up Christian. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to have my altar call moment. But, you know, let's have some fun in college first or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, um, so so then honestly, so after after Constantine dies and then his kind of sons and nephews and there's sort of the Constantinian lineage for a while, they, you know, at that point, the, the, the empire becomes increasingly Christian, right? Like Constantine didn't declare Christianity the state religion. He just said it's a tolerated religion and it gets the same benefits that paganism does. And he, as he's building Constantinople, he's not building pagan stuff, but he, you know, it's kind of this in between, you know, live and let live. I think Constantine thought, he, Constantine really believed in reason and that he's like, you know, the pagans will come around eventually. Eventually. They'll they'll see the errors in their ways, and we'll just we we don't need to persecute the pagans yet. We'll we'll just let Christianity have its moment in the sun, and then everyone will come around to that. But but eventually, you know, once the empire becomes Christian, you know, over the next couple decades, um, I mean, I could talk about the Aryan conflict. I'm trying to avoid talking about the Trinity, but the Aryan conflict is essentially then a Christian civil war where yeah. there are gangs of Christian theological thugs fighting each other in the streets over the nature of Jesus. And they're very violent, right? And then like, you know, there there's like some story where, you know, one of the, the sons or grandsons of Constantine who is an Arian was in charge for a while. And he's putting Arian bishops in charge of all the cities to try and make the <laughs> empire Arian. <laughs> And then when he dies, like, you know, the couple days after he dies in Alexandria, a mob goes and finds the Aryan bishop and like drags him through the streets until he dies naked. And they take all of the Aryan nuns and do not particularly nice things to the Aryan nuns. And like, you know, it's just horrific and gruesome right yeah. and it's not the pagans doing that it's the non-aryan christians doing that and i'm not saying the aryans did equally bad things but like you know it, it was just it, it was very violent um yeah. and it was christian on christian violence and so that so that's part of it and then and then also you know once you're the once the emperors are christian you know they need to fight the persians they need to fight the german barbarians right. you know so right so it's just weird. Do you have a non-Christian army at the command of a Christian emperor? They kind of did that sort of thing for a little bit. And like, so it just the demands of being an empire, you know, either you, you can't, it, it just, you can't be nonviolent when the Persians want to take you over. So, so do you think this is where our friend Julian would come in talking about Christendom and say that essentially though, the big shift the big shift in how Christians acted and manifested their belief and ideals to the world happened when we united Christianity to empire. Right. And when the, the uh, my kingdom is not of this world, well, suddenly it started looking very of this world. <laughs> right. So, so, I mean, all that, like all the history still really fits with my Christian nonviolence. Um, and I think, I mean, there's some ways we could go with this discussion. I mean, we could talk about the, I mean, Preston Sprinkle in his book basically argues some degree of a progressive revelation of God throughout the Old Testament to its fulfillment and full revelation in Christ. So he would say something like in the Old Testament with Israel wanting a king, God was like, no, you don't need a king. I'm your king. Mm. You don't need that. You don't need to be like these other nations. But then eventually he relented and gave him Saul. And then he was like, okay, I'm going to give you what you're asking for, but it's not going to be what you want. Mm -hmm. And then eventually he's been working to resolve that all and give us the perfect king and how the perfect king acts, which is Philippians 2, Christ. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the places these discussions always go to is people love, people love to immediately go to situations so if someone someone hears i'm an advocate of nonviolence, and they'll be like okay somebody breaks into your house yeah they slit the throats of all your kids they're raping your wife you just stand there and that's love <laughs> to which um i like how preston responded to this and he said what always happens with these 
it's really to set up hypothetical thought experiments that presuppose that your conclusion is right. Mm -hmm. And so it's really easy to just be like, this happens, this happens, this happens. Zero variables. You know, you see it all objectively, clearly. There's no options. And you're calling that love. Well, you know, I'm not saying that I have a really good answer to that. I'm not necessarily saying that my wife is a big fan of my purported belief. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I do think that's the Christian ideal. And a place I often like to go with it is Jim Elliott, um, which Christians love, you know. Yeah, a the, lot of these the missionary to yeah. some tribe in Peru or something. There. Yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these dispensationalist Christian nationalists, militarists, really will look at somebody like Jim Elliott and just be like, you know, he's a he's a model to be emulated. He was a martyr for Christ. Or they'll look at Saint Paul, or they'll look at the early church as much as they're familiar with it, and look at all these martyrs and just be like, yeah, that's what we should be doing. Uh. Except, you know, they, they advocate this, you know, either just war theory, but actually just war theory is really close to pacifism, if you were to follow it honestly. I mean, it's real, real close. But, um, so I don't know, there's a lot of ways we could go with it. Also, Christian nonviolence, I would say, last thing, is doesn't mean passivity. It's not like it means that you just don't do anything. And you're not fighting against evil. You're just fighting against evil, not with violence, like mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And so I had, I had a Shane Claiborne phase. I bet you probably had a Shane Claiborne phase. Maybe um, still in one. Maybe you're still in your <laughs> Shane Claiborne phase. Um, I don't know, when I was in college, 1920, something like that, right? <laughs> and he, he was a, he was, so if anyone doesn't know who Shane Claiborne is, he was sort of a popular evangelical-ish, or how evangelical he is, I don't know, but he was I think he was pretty evangelical at one point. Still right. Maybe is. And he, he was a popular speaker for a while at evangelical Christian conferences, right? That's where I saw him was in definitely settings that would be considered evangelical and you used to have dreadlocks real cool you used to have dreadlocks wore basically like a tunic you know he looked like a prophet that he made that he made himself yes. he makes his own clothes he lives essentially in a commune he really has in a lot of ways sold everything he has holds everything in common with those around him like he's done it that's one thing about shane claiborne you can disagree with him about stuff follow him around i bet you quit real quick mm -hmm. yeah he seems to have gotten pretty woke um at least in his language i i don't i don't follow him very much anymore but there's a period he's of controversial life. around racial stuff because he lives in the midst of a lot of black people and so i think he i, I mean i haven't followed him really closely but he toes that line mm -hmm. in ways that make a lot of people uncomfortable oh hey <laughs> <laughs> I like oh, your background, Julian. Look at that. I'm working out. Julian's just on the beach like a bum. <laughs> oh, I, Julian, I, I, I Julian I'm, I'm trying to do a few things. Multitask, mix up randos, spice it up a little bit, get some thirst clicks. <laughs> trying to do what all kinds you, of things. What are you doing? Thirst clicks. <laughs> He's running on the elliptical. I'm gliding. I'm gliding smoothly. Those things are nasty. I hate. I hate those machines. <laughs> I can't run. I normally I run outside, but it's been snowing and it's soppy and wet and terrible. How far do you run? Yeah, let's turn this into that. We're talking about nonviolence. So I good. normally run. I don't know. And did you seven to ten miles? Julian, did you ever read um, Shane Claiborne very much? No, but I, I know who he is. Um, have you read any John Howard Yoder? That's that's where I get a lot of my uh, no. stuff from. Yeah, yes, that would be book. that would be my Julian meme when anyone's just like, "Have you read Shane Claiborne? You read Yoder?" <laughs> <laughs> you're you're a little echoey, Julian. I don't know if there's an easy way for you to fix that or not. No, I don't think so. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah, the mic's all the way over there. Anyhow, um, tell okay. us about Yoder. 
Oh yeah, you know what her has this um, his book called The Politics of Jesus, um, where he basically makes this argument for nonviolence. Um, and I mean, his he sort of starts out in the Old Testament with um, like the Old Testament often gets used as oh look at uh, all of this violence. Surely that means Christians can't be nonviolent. And part of what he points out is uh, drawing on a lot of biblical scholarship is that uh, when you're looking at the violence of the Israelites, a lot of what's going on there is that their victory is not is won not through uh, their sort of super uh, military tactics or their weapons or yeah. chariots, but it's won through the power of God. And so yeah. that sort of motif is what it sort of picks up on for um for Christian nonviolence, where it's this, it's it's not relying on like the best method to win, the best, you know, being the most powerful. It's sort of this um, this life lived in the providence of God. And then he just he just moves into the uh, story of Jesus, and then he he sort of sees um, this call of nonviolence just throughout his whole ministry. Of course, beginning with the uh, temptations of Satan, um, where obviously the, the most relevant one would be, um, you know, the, the call to sort of call Satan's um, temptation to worship him and then get all of the kingdoms of the world. Um, and, and Christ renounces that temptation and instead chooses the nonviolent way. And then he has this uh, fascinating interpretation of the Garden of Gethsemane where he says the temptation Christ is wrestling with there is actually the temptation to do the work he wants to accomplish on the cross through violent means. Um, what? Yeah. I, well, I think that, that that's reasonable. There, there's some amount of truth to that. I mean, Jesus is, I think, clearly terrified at the prospect of what he knows is going to happen to him. But I and and there is the you know the Peter cuts off the sword or cuts off the ear of the guy right and then Jesus heals it and I I, I could call I could call down ten thousand angels and before Pilate he says if my kingdom were, were of this world I would, my followers would be fighting for me yeah um, yeah. yeah so yeah. sorry I thought I thought you were talking about him doing like and dying he, on the cross and conquering through nonviolent through yeah that's, means. that is what I mean like, that is yeah. How do you die on the cross and have that be violence? Oh, I mean, I mean, the temptation for Christ in the in the Garden of Gethsemane is: Can he conquer the powers? Can he defeat the defeat death? Can he uh, defeat the empire through ten thousand angels or through yeah the, through the a means viruses? other than through a means other than the cross? Yes, yes, that's yeah. it. And and um, there's also. Your also traces um, the the repeated um, temptations of Satan throughout Jesus' ministry. For example, um, when the followers say, "Should we call down fire in heaven um, on this tribe?" and he said, "You know, this village who's not accepting you," and he says, um, "No, you're just completely missing the point." And there's of course the the Peter temptation. Where Peter says, um, actually tries to stop him from going to the cross. And then yeah. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Um, and, and then the, 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 the whole mystery of what's going on in the cross is that somehow through that act of nonviolence, he unmasks, he shows the powers for who they are. He shows their, their violence. He exposes it. And then through the resurrection, he defeats it and opens up this different path for his followers to follow. And then, which is the, what makes that one, explicit. I'll just give you one more uh, thing I got from Mueller, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> um, no, before before you give your last point, though, what is the way that Jesus opened up for his followers to do to defeat the powers? It's so hard to it? articulate. It's. It's the, it's it's this path of somehow this path of nonviolence. Um, show I mean, so if if the powers, on the one hand, if the powers 
are crucifying the the, the anointed one um, or you know, if you want to be Trinitarian, God himself, if, if they take this perfect man and they crucify him, they sort of, in this act, they expose them, they, themselves for who they are. They're exposed. On the cross, we see, through the lens of the cross, we see the powers for who they are. We see their right. violence. They're trying to expose Jesus, like literally, right? There was that Peugeot video that was talking about Jesus being naked on the cross. But what Jesus actually does is he exposes them back. Yeah, and, and that's part of what nonviolence does. It's by refusing to return violence for violence, you're exposing the, the violence for what it is. It's, 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 kind, it's kind of like a sanctified version of you show me yours, I'll show you mine. Mm -hmm. and, and there's um, another book I was reading is um, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. He has this, gosh, this powerful story of the early Christians, um, there's this group of early Christians who get thrown into the Colosseum and the lions are closing in and the, the gladiators wanting to hack them apart. And then in the midst of this sort of violent spectacle, these Christians huddle together and exchange a kiss of peace in front of everything. And it's just this shocking, um, how do you put this, this shocking um, Juxtaposition. Juxtaposition of, on the one hand, this violent love, this, 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 this love and this connection between these people and this obvious nonviolence, this, this, this goodness that's there, juxtaposed by the fact that the empire is seeking to, to kill them. So I think that's a, an image of the exposure of the powers. And right. So like if you're fighting back, right, if it's just violence against violence and it's just really my group against your group, let's see who's yeah. stronger. But if you do the nonviolent thing, then you're showing you're trying to win an ethical persuasion battle, not a violent battle. Well, I would say you're playing a long game. You're playing the game of the imperishable versus the perishable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what happens in the resurrection is that the way I put it is that in this world of us versus them, Darwinian, the strongest, always wins. Suddenly you have this new path opened up by the resurrection, this, this new world that's born, this, this new creation that happens in time. Suddenly that we, we recognize that peacefulness is um, more fundamental than violence, that peace ultimately trumps that um <laughs> how do you articulate that love is stronger than hate that um it, it, are you trying is, to say love wins <laughs> I suppose, yeah that's a good buffer sticker <laughs> um yeah the, the, it's just that the christians who who are now making themselves part of this resurrection community, making themselves part of this new creation, are testifying and living within this new reality. They're testifying to the fact that peace is more fundamental than violence. Um, and you see, you see genuine fruits of this in, um, in, in the here and now, but I think in some cases you may have to wait for maybe the age to come for the fruits of nonviolence to show themselves. Um, yeah. And so this, I think, gets into an interesting question about what it really means for Christians to be nonviolent today. Because I could say, you know, I haven't punched someone recently. I haven't killed anybody. You know, I haven't gotten in a fight. I'm being, you know, I'm here I am. I'm a suburban dad, you know, living <laughs> in America. I, I'm, I'm pretty nonviolent. You know, I, the last time I hurt someone was by accident. So, uh, you know, look, I'm doing the Christian nonviolence thing. Um, and, and that's where I think, I, I forget which one of you said that in our chat leading up to this, that, you know, in our world in which violence is, it is a lot rarer than it used to be. Our, you know, Steven Pinker, right, all the graphs, you know, violence over time goes down, war over time goes down. Most of us have not probably seen very much violence in our lifetimes, really, maybe playground fights or something like that. But I've never seen someone get murdered. I've never seen someone get shot, you know, uh, all of those sorts of things. So being nonviolent almost seems kind of 
easy or it's easy to claim? I, I don't know what you guys think of that. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely a good critique. Um, I think two ways of responding is that in the first place, a nonviolence is not just sort of a belief or a practice that, you know, Christians just, oh, I'm also nonviolent. I also believe this. It should be an entire way of life. You should have this entire mode of existence, which, 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 which is nonviolent, and that should manifest itself in. Yeah, to bring up eat. to bring up Mary Cohan, the food you eat, the the products you buy, are they contributing to violence, even to creation? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think those are, I think those are part of Christian nonviolence. I mean, that's a. That's a side tangent, but I think it's connected to it. Christian nonviolence is a is a complete way of being. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, and I think Christians who claim to be committed to nonviolence, um, and this is like the this is a super good critique of the Hutterites or most other uh, sort of traditional peace traditions, is that I mean it, it needs to somehow be active. Somehow, you you really need to put stake this. You need to put your life on the line for the sake of this. I think if if you're claiming that there is a more powerful way to respond to violence than more violence, somehow, the, what the Christian needs to do is seek maybe seek out situations of violence and respond and and, and <laughs> the nonviolent response oh, like martin um, luther kinda... king sort of style and there's also these christian groups that will go into war zones and <laughs> and somehow respond unviolently right and like shane claiborne lived in baghdad for a while and stuff like that hey julian you're you're a doppelganger desmond doss hacksaw ridge yeah that's that's um yeah that i mean there's the perfect example right Gosh. well and also to your point i think so a couple things, uh, um, you were saying like, it's easier to be, one of the things I thought when you were saying it's easier to be nonviolent now because there's just less violence in the world. A great, a great question to that is why? Why is there so much less violence in the world now than there was 2000 years ago? Yeah, with I mean, I bombs. No, the, wor <laughs> the world, I would say because the world has been Christianized. Yeah, that's true, um, but it's... But then, all, I mean, that's an aside. We can go down that rabbit trail. But, but to your point of, we were talking about this earlier before, like in our conversation, is that it's, and, and Sam touched on it earlier, is it's easy, it's easier to kind of outsource your nonviolence. Like the monks in the monastery are nonviolent. Mm -hmm. You know, they're nonviolent, but we have, a, but we right. have an army. Right. So yeah. like my, my parents' house got, you know, broken into and some people tried to steal some stuff while they were away from their house. And so they called the police. Right. You know, my dad had, you know, some sort of security system. It said someone was breaking in. So he called the police. Is that violent? Right. You know, like he, he's calling these police officers who have guns on them and who are legally authorized to use force to, you know, try, try and stop these people from stealing his property and make his house safe. You know, uh, it is, you know, where does, how does that fit into this nonviolent question? You know, he didn't wish anyone dead or anything like that, but uh, th that's a fuzzy line. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. A really good question. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <old Luke. laughs> uh, I, I'm sure that Jeff will be able to give us a great um, thumbnail with, uh, with this. Does he still have a shirt on? I think he has a shirt on. And then there's just the question of, you know, we pay taxes and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, if you're an American or even a Canadian, you know, your taxes go to support the police and the military and all of those sorts of things. Um, let me bring up the other thing I wanted to bring up from Yoder's book and maybe this will tie in a bit. Um, it doesn't exactly, but um, like one of the, 
concepts here to introduce is, which is, and it's kind of famous for this, is what it calls revolutionary subordination. Um, and you have in the, in the New Testament, you have all of these passages which talks about, um, you know, slaves submit to your masters, women submit to your wives. Um, th th there's these passages are called um, house 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 tafel, I think, is the, yeah. um, or, or something like that. And there's sort of translated as household codes. Mm -hmm. And and his read on these is that it's. It's a sort of stance that the Christian takes towards the powers that be, which could be called benign indifference. It's sort of you're you're existing under these power structures, but you you sort of um, have this stance of you don't care, you don't um, think their authority is ultimate. You serve a higher lord. Um, and, and, and you're fundamentally free from, from their dominion. And I think a, a good example of this in the New Testament is when Paul tells Philemon to go back to his master. Yeah, yeah. And, and, Christian, and people often read this as, oh, look at Paul, he's just um, sort of legitimating the powers that be and he's, he wants to continue the institution of slavery. Yeah, he says, uh, not Jacob's I, favorite book in the New Testament. <laughs> But, but what he does is he tells this, the master to treat this guy like a brother. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that is the Christian way of subverting the power structures is if the master treats his slave like a brother, that is sort of just going underneath this power and, and subverting it from the root. Because what, what, what makes slavery possible is precisely treating people like animals or treating people not like your brother but like um like a slave so here i so i've i have a thought about this that i've been thinking about and that submission voluntary submission is one of the ways to defame violence right so part of the reason why states use violence right is like the reason why police will go and arrest you know a criminal right is because the criminal is not submitting to the laws of the country in some way or what other and so the reason why the state needs to use violence or need you know it will just say the reason why the state feels compelled to use violence against such people is because they're not submitting and that you could even imagine, you know, like, man, like spouse abuse and stuff like that. I, I bet that it was pr pretty common in Roman days for the, the pater familius of the house to perhaps use violence against women and slaves in his household to get them to listen to what he wants them to do if they're not doing it. And that I'm sure that it was very common for masters to beat their slaves and stuff like that. And that one of the ways that you can defang violence is to voluntarily submit to authority structures, right? But, uh, yeah. Um, I think that's really good, Sam. That actually, what I was thinking of when you were talking about that, and I mean, I know immediately people are going to think of like, oh, right, the way to defeat spousal abuse is to give in to your spouse beating you. Well, I don't know. I mean, to think of a less extreme kind of hypothetical where you're presupposing all the solutions and answers, um, I think it's easy to... I even think about like disagreements with my own spouse. You know, if we're fighting and arguing about something, let's say you're, let's say you're butting your head against a wall over something that you always butt your head against the wall with and your spouse, and you're just doing this in a repeated cycle. One way to defeat and to break that pattern is to no longer participate in it, mm -hmm. to lose, to voluntarily and, lose. And mm -hmm. um, let me emphasize something. This Christian submission the, what we what call revolutionary subordination is not that of a slave or something who just has to submit and so submits. It's a sort of, it's a very subversive kind of free ah. going underneath. Um, and it, it's, it's really hard to, to describe. No, I think it's, it's the free person. It's the individual. And, and it's, it's agape in the person who's above you in the exactly. hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's connected to, I think the fundamental image you need to keep in mind is Christ 
going to the cross. And there he submits with benign indifference to the powers. But in this act, he defeats them and he, he undermines this. He unmasks them and he undermines this system. Yes, and he shows his transcendence and he shows what it's like to deify humanity and to become like God perfectly by voluntarily submitting himself unto death. And, and part, of what, part of what you're doing is you're inviting the person above you in the hierarchy, whether it's your boss or your husband or you know, whatever. I don't need to make this too much about uh, marriage gender roles. But when you voluntarily submit to the person above you in the hierarchy, like Paul is trying to get Philemon to do to what's his, what's his name, one Smith or something, and mm -hmm. that, that you're inviting the person higher in you in the hierarchy to be a Christ-like servant leader too right you're giving them the space to embody leadership the way that christ embodies leadership right hmm. because because there's that verse that pretty much no one likes where paul calls god the head of christ and christ the head of man and man the head of woman right in this you know sort of cascade of you know theoretical hierarchy and and stuff like that and that like you know, you know, fine, I'll be a little bit non-Trinitarian, you know, like Jesus submitting to God the Father is a way of, you know, Jesus embodying the subordinate role, but there's also the way in which Jesus embodies the, um, I don't know, higher role in the hierarchy too, by being the king of kings and stuff like that, and the church being the bride of Christ, and, and Christ dying for his bride is the way to be a, a true ruler. That sounds perfectly trinitarian to me. Keep going. <laughs> I think I think um, I think though that Christianity subverts all hierarchies. And this um, is where yeah, I'm I'm interested to hear you say <laughs> this because I think this is might be something that you and I disagree with. Like I imagine the kingdom of God having I imagine the kingdom of having still having something like hierarchy and like a spiritual bureaucracy made up of saints. Uh in, in the kingdom to come, that is just this sort of perfect, you know, submission to authority and there's no violence and stuff like that. But yet Jesus is still kind of governing through, you know, there's like the 12 apostles who sit on the 12, you know, thrones of the 12 tribes of Israel. And I, I assume that there, there will be positions on the hierarchy in the kingdom of heaven. Um, yeah. But, but it's I would a agree. perfectly there's, peaceful yeah. hierarchy. Yeah, there's hierarchy, but at the top of it is Christ. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. Um, gee, I mean, I, I couldn't so much argue for this because this is more like um, an idea I'm flirting with. And um, I mean, I, 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 I do, I, I think you're, you're right that there's a lot of hierarchical language in the new testament just to just to keep track of this idea and because you're flirting with it let's call it esther keep going <laughs> but um i you know there, I, I think you see for example you have this this whole hierarchy hierarchical, hierarchical pyramid you just described of god and the man and then the woman and so on but you also have you know, like the famous saying in, um, in Christ, there's either slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Christianity is always existing within this tension of the radical freedom that believers have in Christ and that in this body, we are all one and that these hierarchies have been done away with. And at the same time, the reality that we continue to exist under the dominion of the powers, under hierarchies, under systems. And Christians sort of exist within this now and not yet. Um, and our role is to sort of uh, sometimes subvert these hierarchies and um, principalities, sometimes to renew them. Um, but yeah, will there be hierarchies in the age to come? <laughs> Here, do you want, do you want me to, here's my spicy take on there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor male nor feel, uh, female um, in Christ. Okay. I think that Paul envisions that the resurrected people of God are 
androgynous and of one race together. Sure. And, and that like, you know, like there's the, when the Sadducees come and try and like, hey, Jesus, the resurrection is a stupid idea because, right, there's the guy who is married to the girl and then he dies and then the girl marries his brother and then he dies and she marries like seven brothers and, you know, who's, whose wife is she in the kingdom to come? You know, ha, resurrection, mm -hmm. silly, destroyed, logic, right? And then Jesus says that in the, ki in the kingdom, they will neither be given in marriage nor marry or, or whatever, and they will be like the angels. Hmm. And angels are genderless in, um, and so what I think, what I think Paul is saying, and I think this is honestly weirder and more radical than even people have understood it to be, is that eth eth there will be no ethnicity in the resurrected people. We will all be children of God in one sort of ethnicity, nor Jew, nor, no Jew, nor Greek. And there will be no male nor female, literally, and that, and that I think another place that you can see this is that when Paul is talking about gender roles in marriage, right, about, about wives submitting to their husbands, he says, behold, I tell you a mystery that this is a symbol or a type of Christ mm -hmm. and the church. And that what I think Paul is doing is I think Paul allegorizes that, that Paul uses the material physical world, both of the Old Testament and the way things are now, as types of what's to come. And that the type of marriage, you know, where a, a woman submits to a husband is not that the way that it'll be in gender wise in the new kingdom, but it's a type of the church submitting to Christ where we're all the same gender and we're submitting to Jesus. I mean, there, there is no such a thing as power and authority if everyone is perfectly united. I mean, to speak of power and authority- You're, you're on mute, Luke, in case you're, you's trying to talk. In that context, it, it seems, and, and another thing um, you were talking earlier about um, God, you know, Christ being both the ruler and the lowest. This is something Peugeot always talks about and I, it triggers me a bit yeah. because <laughs> the whole point of the gospels is that the king comes as this uh, Nazarene scumbag who's like at the bottom of the, of the bottom and hangs out with all of these lowly people. And then he's, he's coronated on the cross. And the whole juxtaposition there is that, the, that, the, that God himself is, is now the lowest thing. The son of God himself. That's, but that's, yeah, here. But the manifest, yes, the manifestation of God, but that's the juxtaposition. <laughs> that's the juxtaposition that Peugeot is talking about is the top is the bottom. This is the non-duality. Like well, he wants to say we don't, we the don't gospels see... are sort of um, erecting this cosmic hierarchy that sort of, uh, I, I, that's how I read it. Me. it you no, know, it is, but it's a cosmic hierarchy that flips. And this gets into the Jung. People don't see God because they don't look low enough. I mean, this is like, and, and even, okay, oh, so back to Also, the, I should back. say, Zoom's giving me the thing. I, this isn't my pro Zoom account. I probably should have sent the oh. link from the other one. Well, that's we have right. Ten, we have 10 minutes left. And honestly, I probably have about 10 minutes left. So yeah, heads I up, guys, too. 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, then I'll just close it out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had I uh, a feminist thing to I say was, if you want to hear I wanna, it. I want to touch on this gender thing, though, because this is, oh, come on, shut up, phone call. Uh, we lost. It. <laughs> oh, I was. I, I, what you're saying about it, androgynous that reminded me of um, uh, a book I'm reading. It's a sort of history of uh, religion in six the sixties or something. And this guy brings up. Um, he he starts talking about uh, feminism and Christianity, and then he discusses one of the theorists, and and he had some really interesting things to say um, that connected what you were just saying. And, uh, so she basically asks the question, if, <laughs> if Jesus, like, remember the sort of, um, one of the church fathers asked, you know, if Jesus wasn't God, how could it be that he saves uh, all of humanity, right? Um, and then she asks a similar question where she says, if Jesus isn't, uh, if Jesus is a male, how can he save women? And, <laughs> and then what she says is, uh, this is my trainer, so I don't know, but um, I just found it really interesting. So she she says, um, well, he takes on this sort of role as a male, and then he, he subverts this whole 
sort of patriarchal role by, um, you, you know, by, by his weakness, his interaction with women and all of this. And then in the resurrection, he is sort of no longer male or female. He's this sort of androgynous being. And, and this makes him the savior of all of mankind or all of humankind, I guess. I don't know who you're talking to, but that sounds dumb. Um, <laughs> here's, here's the... <laughs> Here's the, this is, I wanted to shoot, the, the spam call ruined my point. Here it comes though. So Preston is going to be talking to Paul pretty quick about his new book, Gendered, which is about all this stuff. And Preston and I have been talking about this stuff for like a couple of years. And so this, this would be my proposal is that in heaven, we are no longer sexed, but we are masculine and feminine. Masculine and feminine are eternal realities of which the logos is masculine. And, and so we won't be, I don't think we'll be sexed. Biology and sexedness, the finiteness is perishable. It will pass away. But, but gender, I mean, depending on how you want to, if you want to say gender is, is like this social, societal, cultural abstraction, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual reality that I think is best spoken of in C.S. Lewis's space trilogy of which there's an excellent Peter Kreft video on the masculine and the feminine. Mm-hmm. I think they're eternal realities. And, and, and that our biological genderedness is not the essence of those two genders yes. themselves. Yes. They are temporary manifestations that in some way point to the yes. greater spiritual reality. A hundred. Yep. Yeah. And I think that is exactly what Paul is saying when he said, behold, I tell you a mystery that this is a type of Christ in the church. Yep, exactly. About- we will always be feminine to Christ. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. yeah that's fascinating. But I'm not yeah. going to get spiritual boob implants. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's just so much. Um, I don't know. Once you start thinking about the principalities and the powers um, and, you know, male and female, um, power and authority, you know, all of this stuff, I, it, it just gets so much more complicated, these types of issues. And, and that's what I, so I think a, an important parallel then kind of from that, that spiritual understanding of the nature of gender is that there's a spiritual understanding of the nature of submission. That when yes. children submit to their parents, right, that's one of the categories of submission in Paul, children to parents, yep. slaves to masters wives to husbands, um, sub, uh, su- um, citizens of Rome to the powers of Rome, right? All of those types of things. We kind of talked about that before Julian got here. All of those things are types of how we submit to Christ as the bride, so, you know, the bride of Christ submitting to Christ. And that one of the things that non-violence, non-violent voluntary submission to proper hierarchy does is that we are bringing the kingdom of God into, I know you're shaking your head, Julian, that we are, that's a way of bringing the not yet into the now, I would say, is this sort of agopic submission to authority. I get very nervous when you say these are types of the kingdom of God because it sounds like you're sort of giving a spiritual um, justification for the powers that be. Which we talked about. I, I did kind of talk about. Luke and I did sort of talk about the spiritual justification of the powers that be before. Yeah, um, the substance of the here. conversation was before you came. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was talking about how how Paul taught submission to um, governments as because they are in some sense foreordained by God because God you know, gave the different kingdoms and people groups uh, their boundaries and their times for them such that the people in them might seek after God, right? There's that passage in Romans, I think it is somewhere that says something along those lines. Hmm. And that, that part of the reason why Paul viewed non-rebellion right non-insurrection as part of a christian distinctive is sort of recognizing that spiritual reality something like that well it, it, it's non-rebellion because the the way of rebelling against the powers is the way christ rebels uh towards the powers by going to the cross yes because like we said jesus submitted to the judicial authority of pilate right 
in some sense, and, and even in the, in the trial scene, doesn't Jesus say to Pilate, you would have no authority if uh, my father hadn't given it to you, right? Isn't there something, a quote thereabouts, paraphrasing, mm -hmm. when Jesus says that to Pilate? Well, that, that, that sounds to me like a sort of almost a taunt that's saying, you think you're such a hotshot king and that you rule over the whole universe, but really the guy who's ultimately in charge is God and I am part of his kingdom and my kingdom is ultimately more, is ultimately defeating your kingdom, even though it's not of this world. That's how I would read that. I think that's partially right, but I think partially Jesus is acknowledging that Pilate has the authority to kill him and he's cooperating with that. Yeah, and in this I would weird say way, the the submission that um that no. that restores proper i don't know principality hood to to the the principalities in power but I mean, julian, that's, if, that's julian right. i fundamentally would, disagree because but julian he the, wouldn't he wouldn't be he wouldn't be like bowing his chest to Pilate to then just voluntarily submit unto death just be like what's up punk i could take you anytime i want but i'm not gonna like that's not what jesus was doing <laughs> come on well it's it's not it's not that he has um, authority over him, because one of the, the later New Testament writers says, if you had known this was um, the Lord of glory, you would not have crucified him. So he's actually saying this was illegitimate. This was, you shouldn't have done this. You don't actually have the authority to do this. And that's the, I think that's the position Christians are in when it comes to the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. They have no authority over us. But we, uh, there's this Luther thing where he says, um, we are subject to all and yet subject to none at the same time. So Pilate says to Jesus in, in John 19, 10. This is the message version. She's like, what's up, bitch? I can take you any time. <laughs> Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And then Jesus says, you would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. Right. Yeah. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is, of, uh, is, more gu is guilty of greater sin. It's a joke. It's like Pilate saying, what is the truth? And the truth is standing in front of him. I think, I think what he's doing is, is he's assuaging his conscience. We so have that one he minute. Will I think, I think a minute. well, I think what Jesus is doing is assuaging his conscience to just say, yeah, your wife had this dream. My father has actually given you this, the authority. It's fine. You can give the go ahead. I think no. he's freeing him to let it happen. No, I think okay, Jesus John is submitting MacArthur. to the proper authority of Pilate and therefore <laughs> reinstituting instituting agopic love in the principality hierarchy. All right. Well, principalities are fundamentally evil. <laughs> <laughs> institutions are inherently demonic who gets the last word cypher where are you jesus gets given the principalities they're good when jesus is in charge of them <laughs> the principalities are evil and christ subverts them <laughs>